Um, okay, so my name's Katrina West and I'm the Director and Lead for Learning at the Powell Cotton Museum and I'm joined today in our presentation by Emma Jane Hamlington, who's our, one of our learning, actually she's now our only learning and engagement officer at the moment, we're in a recruitment phase. So the way we're going to uh, set this out, sorry, Emma Jane put loads of animation in and I'm going to forget to push the buttons at the right time. Um, so the way we're going to set this out is just give you a little bit of background on the museum because it kind of puts the context for why we did the project and, and how we actually did this specific type of project. Um, what it is we do, what the project is, uh, the aims obviously, the process of the project, um, which Emma Jane will talk more to, the lessons we've learned and the impact of the, of the project itself. So as um, Helen noted, we've not quite finished yet but we have learned a lot along the way. So um, we are a museum, house and historic gardens in um, Thanet in, yeah, in, gosh, I've got to be, remember not to be rude about where we are. Um, so I call it the cul-de-sac of Kent, basically, down by Margate, people sort of know where we are. And um, we're a collection of natural history, world cultures, um, we have weaponry, uh, decorative arts, that type of thing. You're going to annoy me with this animation, Emma J. Um, okay, so um, just kind of like we were founded by Percy Powell Cotton. He's a white male, privileged, wealthy, um, went numerous trips across Africa and Asia, probably traveling for about 40 years in total he did manage to get married and have children as well so our collection the, um, were acquired between 1896 and 1940 predominantly through hunting because of the natural history collection the world cultures acquired by purchases and gifts and we are acknowledging now that those purchases and purchases and gifts were most likely gained through undue pressure applied and we are aware of from his diaries that there is theft as well and so I would um, state that we are the definition of a colonial museum. And um, uh, our interpretation historically, as you can see some of the um, elements here, I don't know if you'll pick up my cursor, a lot of it is presented from his perspective. It's his story, um, our marketing collateral as well, our um, curriculum workshops all refer to Percy and his adventures or his exploration and so we're historically uh, one man one museum definitely told from his perspective but the reality is is that Percy Powell Cotton did not act alone and hundreds of individuals both in um, Africa and in Kent and in Asia were fundamental to building our collection and our museum and we know this because Percy was actually very particular in keeping detailed records, taking photographs and film. And so we hold a large archive of around 40,000 pieces of material that identify different individuals that have collaborated through our museum. And so really up until about 2006, the family were somehow involved in our museum. And, and therefore, we now quite openly say this, that we have a historically an organisation that has had an active policy of silencing voices, of silencing voices that are people of colour and um, silencing those voices in our curatorial practice, in our gallery interpretation, as I said, in our marketing collateral. Much of um, our museum has been presented as Percy, a benevolent um, benefactor to those he um, acquired objects from, to those he worked in the safari with, he's been presented as a conservationist. Um, but when you consider we have 13,000 skeletal materials, uh, that kind of seems a contradiction in terms. Um, Percy's been presented as a scientist and researcher. So as you can imagine, we are engaged in a decolonization agenda. So um, that, that's quite significant as to why our podcast, uh, I've just told you what our project is, as to why our project is what our project is. I'm not going to go through decolonization because it is a huge area to cover. I've spoken on it previously. And um, if anybody does want to know what our work is, they can obviously contact us later. So in 2019, we presented to our trustees a paper for decolonization, a request to embed this actively to change our organizational culture from one of white privilege to one of coalition and collaboration. 
And in 2020, notwithstanding the fact that COVID occurred, we embarked upon a series of multiple projects to start this work. And it was at this time that the uh, grant scheme for creative collections appeared in our horizon. And we thought, you know, it's come at an opportune time because its primary remit is, as Helen said, to develop collections to be more inclusive and relevant to our communities that we serve. So it met our ambition to give voice to the silence, to actually actively engage and make changes. So um, that's a real brief run through of who we are and, and where we got to before we applied for the grant. So we made the decision to apply for the grant to engage in a series of podcasts. Um, our galleries are typically uh, text-based and image-based interpretation. And for us, this was um, noted an opportunity to take a risk and an opportunity to pilot something we've never done before. Um, so that was, that was the general idea. The podcasts also give in-gallery experiences, but also means that we have interpretation that's accessible and away from the, the galleries themselves. The project aims, um, obviously we have a number of complicated and different, difficult historical narratives to deal with. And so being able to talk to our community groups in a transparent way and for them to talk openly and honestly with us, um, this provides more nuanced interpretation about collections objects. It also was about giving our partners safe spaces to talk, um, to give a different viewpoint on collection items that have typically been presented with a white curatorial voice. Um, I'd say that, yeah, we are a white um, uh, staffing group. Um, as I said, it was an opportunity to pilot audio interpretation. And, and, and also we acknowledge that people, we have play in our museum for learning and we have visual interpretation, but audio meets the needs of people with different learning styles. So our community groups, um, because we have an international collection um, and because we are now more working in a digital age and we have the likes of Teams video and we have Zoom, our community groups are global. And so for this project in particular, we have um, our community partners, we're in origin communities in um, Uganda and Kenya, but also we um, have community partners who are diaspora, so representing all of those heritages that live either in the UK, wider Europe or US and Canada. So if we go on, so our first podcast episode was um, with Dr. Imbao Livni talking with Juma Ondeng. Um, Juma is the head of collections. Um, no, sorry. Juma is the keeper of antiquity sites and monuments at the National Museum of Kenya. And he's part of an inventory, um, international inventories project, which is digitally connecting Kenyans with their cultural heritage and European museums. Now, obviously, we have um, large Kenyan collection of artifacts in gallery too. So that's where that podcast came from. Um, our second episode, um, I'm not going to say much about because Emma Jane's going to cover this in um, detail. And so this was a conversation with Margate Pride and this, this Mia Pollock there with the headphones on. And our third podcast will be um, with um, Odeng with um, Lucy um, Endemati is of Nigerian heritage and she's a writer in residence based at the Powcott Museum and she will be interviewing Odeng on the 26th of September to talk about the Dijinga incident and the Dijinga incident, um, I wrote this down, I mean it's a reprehensible act of violence that um, Percy's camp were engaged in in South Sudan whilst he was hunting and in which 10 people were killed and a home office inquiry was had and it's presented in our museum as a skirmish a boy's own adventure and it's wholly inappropriate and there aren't words to describe it but um Odeng is the Jingan um, descendant and Lucy and he will talk to reframe how we present that and it will be a challenging and difficult conversation. We don't know how that will come out, but um, that's what podcast number three is. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Emma Jane now. 
Thank you, Katrina. Um, so my part of this project was mainly to work with uh, Margate Pride, um, and I'll be talking about the processes of what we went through as a collective as well. So um, our first point really was to get the right people in to help us with the technical support. And by that, I mean, making sure that these things didn't sound really iffy and sort of scratchy and all that sort of thing and editing, because it's a hard thing to do and you kind of want the best people to help you do it. Our second point was uh, creating a, a brief and safe sort of space for everyone involved so that everyone had a mutual respect and understanding of what we were talking about and what we might be talking about going forward. And it was okay if we decided differently on whatever projects or whatever. So for me, uh, we invited Margate Pride to come to the museum. We had a little walk around and what we were doing is trying to establish what they might be interested in talking to us about. Um, and it became very apparent when they came to Gallery 3, which I'll show you in a slide yet, but don't change it, Katrina, um, uh, about our textile collection. So we have a really beautiful African textile display, and we were talking about textiles and the importance of them. So one thing that really drew them was our kanga textile. So for those that don't know, a kanga is a beautiful long piece of fabric. It's got a square board around the edge with a Swahili phrase in, or proverb. Uh, at the bottom and either a print or an image in the middle. What makes these um, kangas very special though is they are an indirect way of talking. If you are someone that's silenced for whatever reason, you are able to wear one of these kangas throughout your life um, or use them in your house in a way that can actually translate in another way of talking. And that's really important with the Margate Pride ethos. They're very much working, oh, sorry, the cats decided to join in. Let me get one off. Um, Margate Pride Group are very into looking and giving voice to people that haven't got a voice or are a bit too scared to come out and be who they are in the local community or in the environment. So this kind of really factored in with their flag making and banners and things like that. Um, so we kind of went off like this. I was really lucky as well once we had this conversation. I'd already just just finished an African textiles box for local schools and our loan to box scheme. And I'd spent over a year and a well, just over a year researching them. So I kind of had the idea of what we could do on our conversation and talking. Katrina, could you change the slide for me, please? So, oh God. right. Um, so me and Mia then decided and spoke to um, Pie Factory and talked about what date we wanted to set. And we went to Pie Factory to start recording. May I point out, me and Mia both hate being in front of the camera. And this was horrible. Um, so Matt, the um, sound engineer, actually took this photo. So we're both actually smiling here, but that's because we didn't know what was going on and it wasn't very fun for us at the time. Um, what we usually do with uh, our participants with this is we'll have, uh, if you see, I've got a cheat sheet that's in front of me with questions. Um, Pride were actually going to have another speaker with them, but unfortunately they felt ill with COVID, so they weren't able to join us, I believe. Um, so me and me are actually a bit apprehensive about using the very set structure of questions and answers. So what we decided to do was a more sort of an open style of talking with just key points in Q&A. Um, what made this a bit of a nightmare at the end though for the editing is it may have taken a bit longer. Um, so Katrina, could you change the next slide please? Um, so this is the display I was talking about in gallery three. Uh, the reason we put this one in is if you look in the right hand corner at the top, that is a Kanga just to give you a bit of context while I'm chatting away. Um, so we recorded our podcast. It took 25 minutes um, of editing and in a raw version for the original one. Uh, by Pie Factory and, and they were getting it ready and then poor Katrina had to re-edit it again to a shorter version and rearrange it so I apologise that you had to have, hear my voice on repeat for quite a long time so I'm sure that's annoying. Uh, so we have two versions of our podcast there's one that's uh, just over 20 minutes long is it Katrina? Yeah mm -hmm. just over 20 minutes and then there's a shorter one that's 10 minutes long. Both will be going on the website and you'll be able to access um, one of them in the shorter one in gallery three in front of this display um, what's really interesting about this as well is that Margate Pride have been absolutely intrigued by what we've been doing the whole stages. So they've had access to what we've been doing. Every recording, they've come back, we sent it to them to see how they're getting on with it and what they think of it as well. Um, we've also been invited to join their march in August, which is really lovely. Um, and they'd like us to use our textile box as well as talking to our staff with their younger um, audience, part of their collective about pride and what it means and how uh, you can cover voices and things like that. Katrina, could you do the next slide for me, please? 
um, so this is my last slide. Don't press the button yet, though. <laughs> um, this is um, a part of what we're going to talk about shortly in the podcast. So we're going to play you a very small snippet of this. This is a, um, a kanga made by an artist called Kawira. She's um, from Kenya and she was openly gay. Um, and at this point, she was very much an LBGTQ plus IA um, advocate and really pushing for the changes in Africa and all over the world, really, to make it same sex uh, relationships legal. As in when um, Susan Lucas, unfortunately, she's died, um, 17 countries were still, is absolutely illegal and it could cause a lot of controversy if you ever were to be found out about who you were. Um, so this kanga is um, Angola, it's about Angola. It's a famous trans singer um, on the front of it and she's um, really well renowned. So this is like a gold dust um, kanga that we're going to be displaying. And also Pride are absolutely in love with this one as well. So in a minute, Katrina's going to press the button and play a small snippet, and I'm going to try not to cringe at the sound of my own voice. So Katrina, can you press the button, please? Or just press forward. We can't hear it, Emma and Katrina. Well, I can't hear it. Emma Jane, they can't hear it. Did anybody? I couldn't hear it either, but my um, internet connection right. was just slightly. Sorry. It's not, we can always add this later and we can everyone can hear it then. I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> and the podcast will be available on the website at some point. Um, so, yeah, we're just coming sort of towards the end. The lessons we learned. Um, one thing Emma Jane mentioned was we did have structured interview questions. So the Imbal with Juma, that worked very well. But with Margate Pride, not at all. It just hindered and hampered the conversation. So it's about being in, in, in the middle of a process and saying, OK, we got it wrong. We need to change and moving on. As Emma Jane noticed, editing was challenging. But it wasn't challenging. I didn't mind listening to them on multiple um, occasions. What I had to do was to say, am I silencing these voices? When I make this edit, am I repeating historically what we have done before? And so I was very clear in my head that when I had to make the cut, that I wanted to preserve as much of the context and content that each of the participants was, was giving us. But also I had to balance it against the audience's needs. It needs to run quite smoothly. It needs to be a cohesive conversation that they can understand and engage with because part of the work we're doing is to challenge preconceptions and assumptions when they appear in our museum and also to reverse decades of hero worship of Percy Powell Cotton. So that was quite interesting. Um, I think it wasn't a big thing, but um, Teams video doesn't record at both ends. Zoom does. So we had a small budgetary increase that we, we had to do. So you do need to talk to your specialists in advance. Um, anything with community participants, they're not working to our timeline. You need to bear that in mind. When we started, we had an agreement with um, POW, who were the women and girls group in our area. They had a funding issue with some of their... Um, that they're kind of general basic baseline funding and so they had to concentrate on that and pull away from our project and that's how Lucy and um, Odeng got involved but that was a relationship we already had so it was quite easy to um, bring that in. One of the things is you know that you have to build that relationship of trust, keep that relationship of trust because some of these difficult conversations need to be in safe spaces and we also learned you know for some of our participants, the audio and the conversation was actually a better way for them than, uh, than undertaking sort of the research element of it. So that was that was interesting in itself. Um, impact. Well, we've learned that podcasts are doable. Um, I think, you know, having pilot money, really good. Um, I'm already thinking how we can continue this. Where does it fit in our revenue funding? Um, what's the next area? We've got a case we're doing on Ethiopia. The text that's coming through from the community participant is, is complicated and over academic. But when she talks to me, it's much more simple. You get her passion. So I'm now starting to think, do we move this to a podcast? So, you know, that's great. We've learned 
that there's a different way of doing things. I'd say the conversations have supported the relationships we have because we've been more honest and transparent with each other. We've created a better understanding of what needs and expectations some of our community um, participants and partners have. It is changing our organisational priorities. And I think the big thing is, is we're shifting who holds authority. We're giving up our authority in much of the work we do. And, and I think, you know, I've always been a lifelong advocate that, you know, we are not the specialists just because we have the job title and we're in the museum. We are not the specialists on a lived life with these collection objects. And that's what we're sort of, you know, definitely delivering now. We're not delivering, we're in coalition and collaboration on. So finally, um, so running out of time, um, as always, these are our contact details. Um, you know, we're happy to talk to anybody about the work we're doing. We're happy to expand that out if people are interested in the decolonisation agenda and what that looks like in a local museum. Thank you. Ooh, there's a bit more information. It's really interesting listening to that that previous presentation. Thank you, because there's um there's some some similarities as as, as you would expect across this grant program, but but particularly in um in the sort of like materials and fabrics and those sorts of things that are coming out. So I will explain a little more about this. So um so yeah, my name's Anna Jones. I'm representing Star Museum, and um I'm sharing what we have been doing as part of the Creative Collections grant, and our project is called Threads. So just a little bit about uh, Slough Museum first. Um, it was founded 40 years ago. I keep on saying life begins at, at 40. It certainly feels like for, for, for Slough Museum. But um, essentially the, the mission today is to build a sense of pride in Slough. And um, we're particularly interested in sharing stories that sort of talk about the town as a place of pioneers and innovators and we're doing lots of work sort of to that effect but the um the threads project and this creative collections grant is sort of central to, to what we're doing around that at the moment as well so just a little tiny bit about who i am as well because i am um slam museum don't have any team particularly we're, we, we're very much volunteer led but what we what we're doing is through different grants through different funded programs through different way, ways and means um working with uh, people like myself so either in a freelance capacity or in a voluntary capacity to be able to to to, to drive forward some work for, for for the museum my background um is in the the, the, the sector uh, at the moment I, I also work with um the the Merle and with the museum of of natural history in Oxford, but Slough is home. So Slough is very much a passion and I've been um, a, a volunteer for, for Slough Museum as well as, as I say, currently working as a, as a creative producer. And I'm an artist as well. I'm a, I'm a sort of practicing artist and my work particularly thinks about history and heritage and people and place. So it links really well with, um, with, with, this, with this funded program. So in terms of where the museum has been and then sort of leading where it, where, where it is, in, including this, this project, even before COVID, Slam Museum was facing almost imminent closure. We were sort of, they had a perfect storm of, um, of issues and problems. Some of these will be all really familiar to you within, within the sector, but they just sort of hit Slough all, all at once. And we had a complete cut to um, any, any support by the local authority, any core funding, any project funding, there was, there was nothing and continues, that continues to be the case. And so that meant that we, that we lost uh, staff. It also meant that the collection was completely mothballed into not really appropriate storage. We lost at the same time our dedicated space for any exhibition or engagement work as we were um, had a really great space at the Central Library and, and that shut. And then understandably that meant we also lost lots of volunteers, lots of um, trustees. But thanks again to the, um, the South East Museum Development Team, we were able to have uh, an MOT. So sort of just a, a test out really um, of where we were and where we could possibly be. And we discovered through this that the MOT didn't, didn't totally and utterly write us off. So we felt that there was some things, particularly through partnership working and particularly through reaching out to the community that we could do in order to be able to, to 
to to continue really to continue being a, a, a museum and not closing the doors and distributing the, the collection which is what we we really felt that was going to happen from that mot that led to support from the arts council for the delivery of, a, of an action plan which has happened over the last 18 months and i've been working on that and that's really stabilized us um ironically during that period of lockdown and slabber council announcing that they were they, they were they are uh, bankrupt uh, as a local authority so some really sort of significant challenges that that we've um that that, that we've faced but we've been enabled through a variety of different support to sort of start start again with a volunteer group and sort of start start thinking about where we are now so we have eight pods in the curve which is the um the cultural hub for, for Slough and we run a, a regular make with the museum session there and, and, and that and those pods sort of talk about the um the industrial heritage and, and, and us as a pioneering vibrant community and then significantly and this really relates directly to the project and, and, and why we applied for this grant we were gifted um a space by the estate owner managers at Seagro PLC it's the largest trading estate in Europe that we have here in Slough it was part of them marking their centenary and that means that the space can now securely house the collection and start to be used for um, new exhibition and engagement activity and this project really has allowed us to sort of kick start that that work um, and then also alongside all of these other things that we've been doing we were also sort of again some, some thanks to some support from 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 this team um, were awarded full accreditation so we're in a much better place now geographically Graphically, um, just, just sort of in terms of resource, but particularly in terms of embedding Slam Museum as part of the wider community. So we've been doing that through the delivery of engagement activities, particularly as I say through through this program, through the Creative Collections Grant, and also uh, quite a, a bit of work with um, with Home Slough, who are the Arts Council's Creative People and Places uh, program, because Slough is one of the identified areas areas that has um, residents with the least engagement in arts, culture, heritage and creativity. So we've been using the, um, the sort of springboard of this grant, the, the, the things that we've been able to sort of have as little green shoots from the threat of closure to, um, to start collecting and communicating with communities the um the stories of the aunt, um for us to be able to, to do some co-creation and um uh, co-interpreted exhibition uh, at our new space which is at the heart of the, of the trading estate and through this uh, as as i'm sure the, the last presentation was as i'm sure you'll hear a lot today all around that sort of idea of changing perceptions changing perceptions of who we are as a town who we are as a museum and who might be able to be working and, and connecting with us but at the heart of all of this it was always around slough as a town of pioneers and innovators so a place where people can um have always done and can continue to discover and invent and and, and create um so we've been working with local groups again um to uncover and share these ideas of hidden histories and they've been focusing on um two key slough pioneers one is lydia simmons who was the the first black woman to become a uk mayor and we also have our our sitting mp tandesi who was the first turbaned Sikh in any european parliament so we sort of felt that the that, that tan and lydia were really representative of the community but also the messaging that we wanted to get out around slough as a place of of, of, of pioneers and innovators we hold lydia um, Meryl Road in, in the collection. It's part of the Slam Museum's collection, but it was previously folded up, boxed away. And so this grant has been able to allow us to care for it and start being able to think about just how we display it properly. And also the project has meant that we have made a new acquisition, which is brilliant, of one of Tan's turbans. And so we're able to kind of display that and then spearhead our contemporary collecting through that so that we can start better representing Slough communities. 
This is a lovely photograph of Lydia. Um, this again is in our collection and it just shows you um, the, well, the joy here that she, she's got of looking in the, in the mirror. This first um, black UK um, mayor, black female UK mayor. And this is the robe that we, that we have in the collection that's forming part of this display as part of this Threads project. This is Tan, for those of you who don't know, you might have seen him shouting at Boris Johnson. If you haven't, then um, no party political broadcast, but it's really good to look up what Tan has has said um, to, 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 to Boris about representation um, and, and wearing symbols of faith. Uh, so what we've been doing today is working with community leaders and thinking about those that work at the heart of their community. I mean, that's coming up again from, from the presentation before about how important it is to work with, um, with community leaders to connect um, beyond um, what, I, what I can do uh, just as a sort of a, a resident and an artist and, 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 a, and a project manager for the museum to say so connecting with the South Caribbean Forum. So we've been doing that in order to play Lydia's story along with other stories of those that came over as she did to Slough as, as part of the Windrush generation and we've also been connecting with uh, the Gudwara in Slough um, to connect town stories to Sikh traditions and, and current experiences of that community. Um, as Helen alluded to earlier some of us are at different stages with the project we've done a lot of the groundwork a lot of that community engagement work which is brilliant but there have been many challenges to this project as there are are for our sector and, 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 and partnership working but that's particularly been around around time frame um, the museum move date uh, of moving into our new space in the trading estate slipped a long time and then that sort of had that knock-on effect of, 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 of our work with the community um, we didn't have any existing links with the Gudwara and the Sikh community I knew um, Tandesi as a as a as, 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 as our local MP but it's felt like it's needed a really long lead in time to feel meaningful so perhaps again you know if we were going through this process again I might have just connected with um, a community group that we did have existing links to but but again you know it has as, as the project has intended allowed us to reach out to beyond who we might normally do but it's, it's taken a, a, a long long lead in time for, for that to feel meaningful and also um, brilliantly other Slough partners have felt really inspired by by the project and the talking about it I've done and then working with particularly with the, with the Caribbean for, Forum to talk about it um, and we've spent some time trying to link them to the activity but that's really sort of slowed us down considerably as well so it's just a sort of note to self and and and, and note to you about um yeah you know what's possible with a small grant with a small team with a with a reasonably small small time frame and um Although all of these things, all of these sort of challenges have um, have also meant that there have been some really lovely and unexpected connections and outcomes that, that we've made, particularly through linking with other local artists, which has been really, really beneficial. Um, Calvin Ruan, the Without Shape and Without Form Seat Gallery and with, and with Jelly. And um, that's allowed us to do a number of things I'll just touch on in a moment, but particularly we've just, you know, Know, had this sort of long term, longer term process of thinking about threads as the title when we applied we didn't we didn't have that title we were thinking obviously about the the, the, the two collection items that, that I mentioned Lydia's robe that we already had and we've been able to to care for more adequately and then this new acquisition of of Tan's turban but now we are thinking much more and we started using um the idea of threads of fabrics as textiles as a starting point for the discussions and that's allowing us to create a third piece for display that's that's being co-created with the with the participants. Calvin, one of the artists that I've just mentioned, is going to be creating this um, this painting of Lydia for us alongside uh, the robe that we'll display, and he's also going to do the same for Tan as well. This is um this is his one of of, of, of Lydia, and and it's to scale. These are sort of doors that you know are, are are walkable through. So really large scale mural that that Calvin has created and is creating for the museum. 
the um the the Sikh gallery the without without shape without form Sikh gallery uh, was a, has been a really great connection to make and a really unexpected one and as I say it's taken taken a long time to talk with and and obviously sort of be respectful and patient with people but what this has meant is that we've got some we found some neighbours because they have got, they have got a unit on the trading estate as Slough Museum has where they have this gallery so we've been able to talk about sort of um legacy work and sort of future partnerships because they are they are similarly to us um as i say that they, they are they're resident on on south trading estate and then with um with jelly who are uh, again lo local um artists to us we're creating um a, a loom so it's a, a loom that can be used for discussion so people can talk and, and weave but the idea is is that people will will use either fabric that is meaningful to them or fabric that is found fabric to be able to create this third piece for 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 display so um something that's created together through conversations through dialogue about the sort of history and heritage um of those different communities where they are now and create this sort of shared threads um piece of of, of work and there's Tan. Oh, there's Tan with a mural that that is, that, that is in Birmingham, funnily enough. But um, but yeah, just the idea of of that sort of representation in in art form of these pioneering figures from from Slough. So just to sort of wrap up our on our key reflections to date, very much as um uh, as I think it was Emma Jane was saying that you know. We, we don't know all the answers. I mean, of course we don't, but we don't even know what all of the questions are. And so that talking with the community, having those sort of genuine conversations with the sort of uh, learned experience, the lived experience of, of, of those who we're wanting to work with has been really, really fundamental and, and, and really important. Um, I've mentioned some of the, the really sort of positive things that have come about of like expecting the unexpected. That's, um, that's you know, that's been brilliant. And, and um, yeah, has, has sort of, you know, has, has hopefully meant that it's going to be a much richer um, project as, as, as has it originally been envisaged really just with myself and, 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 and the trustees and the, and the contact that I had already with, um, with the Caribbean Forum. But, you know, um, allowing some time for the unexpected has, has made us have lots more connections beyond, beyond the original plan of, of the work. But then managing expectations comes a little bit around what I was saying of other partners been, been quite enthusiastic about it, but like, what can we actually really do with the um with the time and the resource that we've that we've been allocated for this um I, th I think part of being one of the areas that's part of the arts council's creative people and places program is is making us really much more aware of the the listening and the language that's really important within the community if you're not aware of the program I, i'd really recommend checking it out and lots of the literature that's come out of that um particularly useful i think has been um uh, a paper called power up by chrissy tiller and it's all about um do the different spaces whether that's a physical space or a sort of perceived space for for communities and who owns that space and sort of thinking about um breaking down barriers for, for that uh, partnership and connections are obviously at the heart of this program anyway but they really are totally key but um sort of just keeping an eye on mission creep and not being sort of yeah I mean working in partnership but yeah really understanding like what you can do and, and, and what you can't and I think fundamentally the key reflections have been that this has been really fundamental really helpful for the museum not only opening its doors but opening mindsets of like what's possible for a museum in Slough what's possible and should be um you know how a museum is for for, for a diverse population um, the most diverse in the southeast outside of London and um and 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 what a museum might and could look like for for 2022 and beyond and um and one of the key things that we've been able to do with that sort of time frame challenge and and sort of shift has been making opportunities out of threats so so we are going into shortly um a lot of engagement work and the creation and launch of the display and exhibition to link in with Black History Month. So that sort of like feels like um, a nice sort of happenstance that, that, that wouldn't have happened if, if we'd have been working to the timeframe that we that we originally um, envisaged. And then 
just a little bit here of about sort of this idea of yeah just um being more be that you know the idea of you need to do these things with the support of the colony, colony, colony. No individual honeybee can, can, can survive alone. So, so those are the key reflections that I wanted to share with you. But I also, um, on, on, on the death of our, our, our Majesty the Queen, also wanted to show you a couple of Slough slides. I know that the, the team here, the Southeast New Zealand Development Team, have shared some of Joanna when, when Joanna was in Slough, and um, those are out there on Twitter, but I have a couple more, not of Joanna, but of, um, of the Queen in 1962, when she opened Slough College. And the reason I show these with the idea of, um, of Slough being a town of, of pioneers is I think that maybe the gift that um that Slough gave the Queen in in 1962 might have been why she um why she thought about bringing a bear into her into her jubilee celebrations more, more recently it wasn't Paddington but it was a polar bear these are a couple of lovely photos that I wanted to share with you from from the collection this is the Queen looking rather gorgeous and glamorous in 1962 as she opened Slough College and receiving a polar bear from the students. So thank you for listening. Thank you to the team and um, yeah. So um, Soldiers of Oxfordshire Museum um, is in Woodstock in Oxfordshire. We are approaching our, well, 2024 will have been open 10 years. So um, ever increasingly with our museum activity plan, trying to be a bit more, um, a bit more vibrant, a bit more diverse um, and more importantly, I guess, trying to increase footfall and sustainability as we go, as we move forward. Um, our aims with, with, with the grant, I mean, we were quite fortunate in that when the grant was um, announced, when we saw it, it wasn't that we had to scrabble around and think of a project or even scrabble around and think of partners because we'd already been working with Rana Ibrahim um, with the Iraq Women Art and War Group. Um, but even though that was that was an ongoing relationship, um, we hadn't really expanded on that a great deal other than having sort of one to ones with her and and supporting her with various other projects that she was doing, including BBC Civilizations. And we also supported her with a grant for her to go to back to Iraq and um, talk to artists in Iraq. Um, so when we saw the grant come through, um, we looked at it and, and decided it would be perfect for us to be able to expand that work and to welcome a new community to the museum um, through a series of workshops. Hopefully it would culminate in an exhibition um, and hopefully it would also have a co-curated trail of um, objects that the, the workshop participants would make in response to um, objects that we had on permanent display. And I think for us, the title of um, Rana's group, the Women, Art and War really chimed because obviously we're a, military, we're a military museum. And what we try to do is take a contemporary look at what's going on. So it's not just about the two former county regiments. It's not just about the military bases in Oxfordshire. It's about how war has affected people who have found themselves in Oxfordshire. And obviously with everything that's going on in the Ukraine that, you know, that chimes even more with us. So it's about um, working with a group and looking at the impact of conflict on them. Um, and I think that was really important for us as a, as a museum, but also for the project. Um, so Iraqi Women Art and War, we'd already been involved with them, as I said, and we continue to be involved with them. They are, um, uh, they, they are growing in momentum in Oxfordshire. I'm sure Rana wouldn't, wouldn't mind me saying that. Um, actually, pretty much wherever you go in Oxfordshire, you come across Rana's advertising, her, you know, her, her sheet telling you all about what the, what the project's about. She's very good on social media. She's got a whole YouTube channel now. She's kind of really promoting her work with, with women, not just Iraq women, but also refugee women, asylum seekers, um, uh, women that have been displaced and families that have been displaced. So we had a, we knew we were getting into bed with somebody that was really confident and would see the project through and would be able to draw 
um, a lot of people to it as well. We'd already worked with refugee groups and individuals and in a children and war project um, a year before the museum opened. Um, and we'd worked with um, uh, Asylum Oxford and other sort of community support groups. So we kind of knew that there were, there were difficult barriers and challenges to overcome when you try to engage with a, with, with a new group who actually coming to a museum, participating in a museum isn't part of their, yeah, isn't part of a, a priority for them, nor do they see necessarily the value in it. So we had Rana on one hand who was really strong, we knew her momentum was building, and we kind of knew there would be challenges along the way. So we kind of already learned those lessons. Um, Rana and IWAW were already part of our museum activity plan, and I'll come on to that in a little way. Um, uh, they, they were already doing bits and pieces with us um, in terms of supporting us with other projects. Rana had actually run a few children's workshops for us pre-pandemic. Um, so we knew, um, again, that the work that she was doing for us and with us in the museum was actually a good thread with our museum activity plan and a good thread with funding. Um, and we'd also gone through this, this change of trustees and we'd also had a new chairman. And I think what I guess I'm saying is that the mission, the vision of the museum was shifting. So it was the right time. So, you know, we were trying to get away from just being about, you know, historic conflict. We really wanted to capture, capture modern stuff. Um, and for those trustees and volunteers that didn't really buy into it, don't really buy into contemporary, um, you know, contemporary work that we try and do, we're very fortunate that within the collection, there are lots of historic objects and lots of historic accounts that actually we then use as a kind of, well, this is why we're doing it. So for us, Mesopotamia is, is a big story for, for, for the county and for the county's regiment and obviously Iraq and, and Rana's work. So it, it kind of acted as a, um, well, this is another reason why we're doing it. It's not just about trying to change the tone of the museum. It's about actually, there could be some really interesting work that comes from this. So what did we do? We did three workshops over several months to create original artwork. Um, the women would come in and they would respond to the museum objects in the permanent galleries. And that resulted in a new exhibition, a museum trail and an online resource. Um, I've popped this up because this is kind of, this is kind of the work that Ra Rana did and does with us, kind of bringing in um, uh, her artwork that she's used in different settings throughout Oxfordshire and then turns it into a permanent exhibition, which then means that our, our regular museum visitors are kind of um, led through the idea that actually um, it is contemporary and there are other stories out there. Um, her mini exhibition um, was here while we were doing the work with her that was funded through SOFO, but it just gives you an idea of the type of stuff that she was doing with these, um, uh, with these, with these women in Oxfordshire. A lot of it was done during the pandemic, um, so they were doing an awful lot of participatory stuff through Zoom and through Teams. Um, the grant, we used it in phase three of, of what I would call our IWAW project, um, which was forming part of that wider museum activity plan. Phases one and two were funded by SOFO. Um, there was a community workshop with Little Amal. I don't know whether anybody's aware of Little Amal, but um, it, was, it, it was big here because um, it, it was a huge puppet that came from Syria that was to uh, reflect, I won't click on the link because I'm not so sure it will work, but was to reflect the um, difficulties, um, the experiences of refugee children. And it was, big in Oxford because of um, Alice. So there is a massive Alice from the Story Museum. Um, so we did a first little community workshop with her, which was um, uh, averagely attended, I would say. So we had lots of community families and children came in and they did messages of support for when little Amal was arriving. They made little puppets, um, they did footsteps. 
Um, and that was really the start of us um, reaching out to beyond the confines of the museum. Um, and then, as I just showed you, IWAW were exhibiting at the museum with previous artwork, most of which had been generated through the pandemic. Phase three was where the grant really um, expanded and meant that we could do much more participatory work. So we could take a role in, in running those workshops and be, and be really there sort of um, supporting, but also instigating some of the things we wanted to come out of our work with them. Um, the, the, the grant allowed us to fund for 15 participants and their families, and they would, came into the museum, I think it was three or four times in the end, um, talks, object handling and gallery tours. Um, and, and I think it was, it, it was pressured in the sense that it was four long days um, and we are a very small staff here. And actually our collections manager who had put the grant together and the application together had, had left. So it was even more difficult to try, you know, to keep, to keep the grant going and to keep those workshops going um, when it, it, there's a member of staff that's actually, you know, uh, has moved on. Um, but nevertheless, you know, we cracked on and um, uh, if ever you meet Rana, you'll realize why we cracked on because she wasn't about to let us not. Um, this is uh, the, the, the ladies um, coming into the exhibition. This is Rana, um, obviously talking to them about different artworks on display, some of which they will have contributed to, some of which they will never have seen before. Um, and uh, getting used to that space in the museum. Um, I've popped this one up because, and I'll come to it in a little while, one of the other learning things that we definitely learned, if that's proper grammar, is that the social aspect of, um, of these types of workshops, these types of all day participatory workshops is really important. So it doesn't really matter what your timetable says, you might think you're breaking for 30 min minutes at lunch, but for lots of these women, um, it was a real social thing. So lunch might take an hour and a half, and actually you have to start rethinking what you're doing in that afternoon session. And actually, are you going to achieve all the aims that you want to do? Is there gonna be at the end, a mini exhibition? Is there actually gonna be anything that you originally had said you were gonna do? Um, and children, um, this was also one of the learning things for us because we had accommodated and planned activities and events for the for, for the ladies, for the women, to do these um, tours, to do these handling objects, um, to respond to the museum galleries, um, but they all came with children and quite young children at that. And actually, we hadn't thought about how we're going to occupy those children. Um, but nevertheless, you know, uh, fantastic workshops, lots of happy, smiley people, lots of happy, smiley children, um, and lots of engagement. Um, so in terms of, in, I think in terms of our experience of it, it was all really positive. Um, one of the outcomes that we had put into the grant was there would be this co-curated trail of objects that the, that the uh, participants would um, work on. So it tended to be the same participants going to every workshop. Um, many of them uh, were not familiar with, with, with creating art, with, with responding in that way. So I think our aspiration in the museum was that we would come away with really fantastic, creative, diverse art responses to our objects. Um, but because of the, uh, because of, um, I guess, our skill, so not, you know, none of us that was leading it um, were really proficient at any of this kind of stuff, you know, making collages or, or, or a creative environment. We really needed another artist with us. That's one of the, the learning outcomes from it. Um, we, 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 worked with clay. 
So this was really good because the women felt very comfortable with it um, and it could be done really quickly and it meant we didn't have to worry too much about, um, you know, people coming back and adding to the add into the trail or add into the artwork but I would have to say that at the beginning of 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 the project we had a much higher aspiration and expectation of what this artwork because this is what stays with us this is what's now in our um in our pods um what was more interesting about it I think in terms of the process was these pieces so that on on the little fruit bowl you can see, it is, it is a fruit bowl, it's food in a basket. That was in response to um, a image in our blood and war pod um, about soldiers in the Boer War looking forward. You know, we have a diary, we have a transcript of a soldier in an, an etching looking forward to his meal that night. And this chimed with one of the ladies who was talking about food and how food is really important to her, her family, her culture, and it's the thing they look forward to and it's the thing that brings them together. So the, the, the process was really interesting, um, how they responded to the actual objects. The other object is actually a toy. And this was in response to um, our prisoner of war pod where prisoners of war very often um, would, would, would create things. Um, and this was actually a toy that a, a Oxfordshire-based prisoner of war made for um, a, a local family. Um, and it was a, a, little, a little, it's a little hen, a little chicken that sits on a piece of wood that runs up and down the wood. So this was actually um, Rana's response to that object. So really interesting to, to, to sort of get a different perspective on your objects and then to have this trail positioned next to those objects so that other visitors, when they come out, come in, can see how, um, how our visitors uh, respond to, you know, things that are already in the cases and, and what chimes with them. Um, and obviously all of the captions were in English and they were also um, in Arabic. So the longer term outcomes for the project, I think um, the key thing for us is contemporary collecting has really been stimulated. So we are actively now um, pursuing um, people that have, be, that have found themselves in Oxfordshire, um, whether it's through um, asylum or whether as displaced people, refugees, that any items that they that they have bought with them from their own cult from their own country and reflects their own culture um, is really important to us we may not we may not be lucky enough to get those objects but we certainly have a record um, of what is out there now in Oxfordshire um, clearly um, it made us much more inclusive activities and events although the the women that Rana and we worked with um, uh, most of them knew one another, most of them were from Iraq, but a few of them were not, they were from other communities and other settings, um, which was great because it was a real kind of thing for the staff, the volunteers in the museum to actually have that social time and also to hear other people's stories. Um, I wouldn't minimise the importance, and again, we wouldn't have thought this at the very beginning, the importance of this project in terms of engaging with our volunteers, who would probably never have expected when they signed up to volunteer one year, two year, five, ten years ago, that they would be involved in, in, in this type of project. Um, it, it's given us a great resource for social media, um, obviously, uh, one of the weeks that we were doing one of the workshops was during International Women's Day. So it suddenly meant that, you know, rather than having to scratch around in an archive, which strangely enough is predominantly male, um, there was then suddenly lots of, 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 of female material, female voices, um, and clearly for Refugee Week as well. Um, and, and Rana has, has, has continued, that relationship has continued. So, um, we now have um, pop-up events. We have an Iraq cafe um, twice a month, which again, at the start of the project, we would probably never have thought that was gonna happen. 
but I guess because um, she and her uh, and her and her supporters, her, her women that come in quite regularly, feel it's a, it's a nice space. They feel welcomed. Um, you know, they they've really added to our activity as well, which has been great. Um, and we have this ongoing exhibition, which is where I'm sitting now, actually. <laughs> so um, uh, we we distilled from the workshops work we wanted to keep here, and it's up on a balcony that we've never used before for exhibition space. Um, and it's and it's flagged up throughout the rest of the museum. So people might come in. They might come in because of the pop up cafe. They might come in because they they've heard something on social media, or they might be in the main galleries and they see the trail. Um, and then they come up, and this this gives Rana um, and IWAW even more of an opportunity to tell their story, which I think is really important. And it's really important for us because it feels like we're giving something to them. And it wasn't just about us taking. Um, so they have a real space here that they can add to. Um, and, and it's just meant that it's, 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 it's been more vibrant for us as a museum. Um, what we learned, I, I keep on talking about Rana, the importance of that prior relationship, absolutely. Um, because um, it meant, because we, we sit in Woodstock in Oxfordshire, which is, um, you know, I'm never even sure whether it's a village or a town, but it, you know, it, it's got a definite feel and a definite tone to it. Um, transport links have got better, but they're not perfect. Um, and so trying to get people to come to this museum is always a challenge. Um, but because we already had Rana and we knew that she would be able to generate enthusiasm um, and that she would be able to get people to come, um, that was a big tick for us in trying to do this kind of project, really. Um, language and cultural awareness. Um, I, I talk a lot. I talk very fast. I um, jump from subject to subject. So one of the learning things for me was when I was taking a group of women around the museum and looking at objects. And, and obviously that was part of the project about them responding to objects. Actually, if English isn't their first language, I, I need to slow down, I need to have a better script, I need to, you know, take my time, I need to, to choose, um, not, you know, not assume prior knowledge, even of, you know, World War One and World War Two. you know, don't assume anything really. Um, and actually, the language and the cultural awareness, um, although I don't think so much for us the cultural awareness, but the language was quite important, and that was one of the reasons why so many of the women brought their children with them because obviously for their children English was their first language and even something as simple as um, talking about uh, uh, um, travel claims because obviously we paid for everybody's travel you know even you know explaining that and, and, and getting that sorted out and bank details and all of that so clearly for the women um, yeah, looking after the children on a Saturday was, was, was their job, um, but also making sure their children were with them to, uh, to in many ways, act as interpreters. Um, I mentioned this when I flashed up the picture, the social aspect really needed, you know, uh, needs timetabling. So, you know, I've, I've already mentioned that, but um, I would get worried that we were going to run out of time because everyone was having such a lovely time, but actually was any work being done. Um, and, you know, just chill out from that, really. Um, children, they're inedible and they needed to be catered for. Um, I think if we had, or if I had clicked into that before, then they're probably, rather than running around the museum, loving dressing up and doing all of that, they might have had a, you know, um, a, a different experience. Not so much better, because I think they were all very, very happy indeed. Um, and I've put tone and atmosphere of the museum changes. So, um, uh, as you can imagine, um, uh, the museum is, is fairly quiet. It is a place where people um, can come into. We aren't terribly busy. If you come in as a visitor, you might be in here with maybe a maximum of 10 other people. So you have the time to be able to wander around. You have the time. We are a very wordy museum. Um, so you have the time to, to, in, to experience the galleries in a really peaceful, calm atmosphere. We are not geared up for 
um, uh, vibrant, loud activity. We just aren't, you know, the building has one meeting room, which is at the end of the museum. It isn't soundproofed, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it was, uh, it, those days when we did this project were lively, lively days. And we sit on a site with another museum as well. So yeah, it, it, it was busy, it was full on, um, but it was great. It was absolutely fantastic to see the museum and to hear, um, uh, you know, there was there was an element of singing, there was an element of you know lots of shout, you know, it was it was definitely different to what we normally have. Um, and I popped on there, any space can work. So I'm always really worried about you know about doing mini exhibitions or or doing kind of projects where actually how how you're going to plan it in, how you're going to work with it. But actually, um, we are a small, you know, we are a small museum, but we've managed through this to suddenly find a space that works. And it would only really have been because we had to then house this mini exhibition and we wanted to house it and we wanted to have that, that platform um, that, you know, all of a sudden I'm sitting in it. So, you know, that, that, that is one of my kind of takeaway messages really so rather than saying no we can't you know we don't have the resource we don't have the space actually i think you know most times you can make it and that's it there we go um so following on from anna i believe it was from slough what i hadn't included in my presentation was just a bit about me which i think is kind of relevant to the use of the money in this project um, so I, will, I joined the team at Charleston now as a Kickstarter system. I'm sure many of you will have had uh, Kickstarters on your teams at your various museums and galleries. Um, and when my time at Charleston ended after the six month Kickstart scheme was up, this opportunity and this project and some of the funding was uh, kind of allowed me to continue my time at Charleston. So there is another element apart from the work that we're doing with the LGBT community that has allowed me to use that opportunity to further my career in gallery, galleries and museums, which I'm exceptionally grateful for. Um, but to give you kind of an overview of our project, um, it's called Very Private, The Conversations, and it's an oral history project, probably in the loosest sense. Um, we are having conversations about a very uh, erotic and very kind of sexy and fun uh, element of the collection at Charleston. Um, Duncan Grant, uh, who the museum is largely dedicated to, along with Vanessa Bell, one of his partners at Charleston, um, produced 422 or more, actually, of uh, these erotic drawings and the, the collection at Charleston houses, 422 of these very saucy drawings. Uh, I've selected a few here that I, I hope won't, uh, won't embarrass anyone too much, but there is a lot going on, just to, to make you aware. Um, but the conversations that we wanted to have were around the kind of contemporary resonances of these drawings today, you know, what do they mean to the LGBT community, because these drawings were largely produced somewhere between, we don't know exactly when, because he kept them totally secret, but largely produced between the 1930s and the 1950s. Um, and it's an amazing and, uh, <laughs> and completely unabashed collection of uh, the, the most wildest and also really stunningly beautiful drawings that talk about kind of interracial relationships as you can see here kind of um, erotica and also kind of the queer experience at that time and of course these drawings were produced when being homosexual was entirely illegal and uh, the reason that it's called very private is for two reasons um, when Duncan Grant passed these these amazing drawings the 422 of them we now have on to his friends um, he kind of gave them away and uh, on the that they were in a binder folder and all that was written on the top was very private you know don't show them to anyone these are entirely secret uh, and in his lifetime actually he had various kind of um, kind of royal commissions and worked as a commercial artist so this would have been incredibly damaging to his reputation and other members of the Bloomsbury group whom the museum is also dedicated to uh, they they, they when various biographies were written about them in the 80s lots of them expressed uh, a wish that the kind of private lives that we now know the Bloomsbury group for were largely concealed and that 
various publishers waited until after they had passed to reveal kind of the more intimate details of how that group operated uh, and their outlook on society as a whole. Um, so what we want to do with these drawings is have a fresh look at them now that they are going into the first exhibition. This is their first kind of public outing, as it were. And we wanted to get responses that weren't art historical. We wanted input from the communities as a lot of the other projects have been based around that. Um, and I say we use oral history in the loosest sense to define the project because what we're actually trying to do is spark conversations between people and just see kind of what their organic responses are to this amazing collection of work. Um, so, sorry, I'm just reading for some notes as well. Um, so generally we're producing a unique audio project documenting experiences and stories specifically from 12 members of the LGBTQ plus community um, in response to artworks and themes in the current exhibition, which is also called Very Private with a question mark. Um, these recordings will be shared online and they will produce six conversations. So we're grouping the, the, the participants together in conversations of two people and I remember talking to Helen about this in the kind of introductory call that we had and I said you know I'm an avid listener of Radio 4 as I'm sure many of you are and uh, I said I really enjoy the listening project and I want to make the listening project but really really gay and <laughs> Helen's laughing as she did at the time uh, and that's kind of that was the vision for the project. It was kind of a brainchild between myself and some of the curatorial team at Charleston. Um, initially, when the, the funding kind of application passed my kind of internship desk as a, as a curatorial assistant, it was kind of, you know, could you, um, could you maybe find, get, get us this, this pot and we can do some interesting things with it. Uh, what I wasn't charged with was devising a project that we could, that we could make. And I kind of thought this was a really exciting opportunity to make something that I would really want to listen to. I've been aware of a few other podcasts like uh, the Switchboard podcast uh, that had documented LGBT experiences. And there was also um, the performance artist and uh, a Manchester Museum kind of infamous tour guide, David Hoyle, said something in an interview that I, uh, that I um, had seen where he, he said, uh, you know, he was asked about the the generational gap in the queer community and he was asked what is the what is the relationship between the LGBT community uh, members who fought for rights in the kind of 60s 70s and 80s and even earlier and the generation now and the only thing David Hoyle could respond with was there is none and I thought that was a severe problem and I saw this as an opportunity to engage diverse members of the community but also intergenerational members of the community to create a project that really kind of captures not only that kind of difference and gap, but acknowledges the hard kind of fought battle that has gone on to end up in a place of, you know, considerable liberalism, depending on your politics, that we live in today. Um, there's still so much more work to do. And I think it's the, the kind of overriding vision that the Bloom to be Greek provided. Uh, with their kind of experiments in living, their experiments in sexuality at Charleston, that is kind of um, something, you know, a resonance that we're tapping into in these conversations. And it's a project that we are about to start officially in the next couple of weeks in, in terms of the recording process, but it's been an experience in terms of getting to this point. There have been lots of voices involved and we do have an LGBT steering group. So there are lots of voices in the mix. Um, Following on from the last speaker, I would say that's something I hadn't anticipated in the process of making this, but it's been um, a really educational experience for myself and it's been, it's been really lovely. Um, I've covered that, sorry. Um, so um, in our early development of the project, the team at Charleston um, and I felt this would be a really dynamic way to explore our collections as well. And the, the way the project has evolved is it's gone from being solely about the drawings in the collection to also being about this exhibition very private. And we wanted to make it something that wasn't an art historical inquiry. I think that's kind of our motivation key behind the project is that what Charleston does is that we have a lot of kind of speakers, a lot of people with very authoritative voices on this topic. And we wanted to make something that was really from the bottom up. 
because we spend a lot of time, I think in the industry as a whole, but we spend a lot of time speaking downwards in you know the best possible sense, but also really not listening to some of those voices and taking them with the kind of weight that they deserve. Um, I also wanted to make a really interactive project that would kind of um, share experiences of queer love, intimacy, joy, and also sometimes sadness. And I think that you can only get those from those organic kind of interactions between two people. And that's one of the things that's really exciting about the project. Um, so, you know, there have been a couple of bumps along the road, as, as Helen knows, um, but that decision to open up this project to the contemporary, uh, the contemporary responses by the artists in the exhibition and tie that in, although it kind of delayed our timeline a lot, I would say with the project, it does allow the project to serve a really vital function in our exhibition period coming up. And one of the things that I am particularly looking forward to and love the idea of is that as people are walking through the exhibition season at Charleston, they will also be standing exactly where we recorded the podcast and where these conversations are being had. And we're all familiar with the very quiet gallery experience. And I think it's lovely to interrupt that. And we have an app at, at Charleston. It's kind of an audio guide called the Bloomberg app that some of you may be familiar with or may use in your museums. And these podcasts will ultimately be destined for the app as well as for my playlist. And it will allow people to experience these conversations in a very visceral way, I think, that you're in the exhibition space and you can, you can hear the voices and the experiences of these members of the LGBT community responding to the same works that you are viewing, which have also been commissioned by Charleston, in addition to Duncan Grant's erotic drawings. Um, Sorry. Ed, Ed. I'm just sorry, I'm just butting in quickly. Um, I know you have a couple of other slides, but you have, but we yeah. only got your holding slide. I just wanted to double check no, that was okay. No, no worries. I'm just Brilliant. coming up with slide change. I had. Sorry, and I just wanted to, I know you've only got a couple. I just wanted sure to. Sure, they edited out. I, I had a whole kind of speech thing, and I thought actually everyone else has done a more organic approach, so I'll take the same route. So I've changed tact slightly there. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, in terms of the project outline, I don't know, oh, there we go. So what we're we doing. Um, so I've kind of explained some of this already. So our oral histories, we use the term really loosely here. So they are really guided conversations. And what we're doing is we're having a new queer house tour. We've done previous queer house tours um, that have, you know, they've been met with, a, I suppose, a mixed response. Some people felt that they were not really queer enough. And I think where they were coming from, having not been on them myself, actually, is that, um, what they discussed is the historical context and the queerness of Charleston as a space and the way the Bloomsbury group operated in that space and formed it into a kind of queer utopia. But of course that came with a lot of privilege. We're not talking about diverse people and we're not talking about people with an insignificant amount of money. And I think that what we've tried to do, and I say we, um, myself and our PhD researcher, Samson Dietrich, We've tried to uh, rewrite that house tour using the original as a basis, because it has all the good art historical things you want, um, into a more contemporary house tour that makes people think, uh, how does this relate to me? How am I a part of this? Rather than just figures from the past that have, have been in existence and we're just hearing about, you know, what, why does this matter effectively? Um, so our participants will, will go on the house tour, which I'm very much looking forward to semi-leading, uh, and they'll be equipped with some knowledge, uh, but not too much. And I think that's one of the conversations that we had quite early on. We do want these conversations to be organic. We want them to be spirited. We don't want them to be over-intellectual. And, you know, they, so our participants will have some knowledge, but they're not going to be overloaded. And there will be some kind of informal prompts and from that, effectively, we're putting microphones on people and saying, go explore the exhibition and then come back to effectively the cafe and have a chat about it. And we will see where we go. And I imagine we will have more than 15 minutes of, uh, of content and that's all the better. And then that will be edited down into approximately 15 minute conversations of which there will be six, you know, with two people each. Um, so the prompts will reflect the themes of the exhibition uh, and we will be pairing a more mature member of the LGBT community 
with a younger member of the LGBT community. And that will also in itself form a topic that I think will be, um, I think some of these conversations, it's always been our hope that they will be open, honest and extremely kind of spirited. It's not, you know, the work is not family friendly and I don't think the podcast will be either. And that's exactly what we want. We want to do something a little bit different um, in, in, in short, a little bit racy and something that really challenges. And there have been lots of things within these drawings that I, for everybody's sake here, maybe didn't include in some of these slides. Um, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about it. There's a real sense of discovery here. Uh, I thought that I was pretty well versed in LGBT culture and the community. And then actually coming to this project, it has been awakening for myself. And there are things in those drawings I didn't know they did in the 1930s. And that's lovely. <laughs> um, you can edit that bit out, Helen. Um, so there will effectively be a, a permanent online store of all of this, of all of these conversations. Uh, one of the scary things about letting go of this project after devising it, as me and Helen have discussed actually, is you don't know where these conversations are going to go and that's one of the hard things about talking about it right now as a project that's nearing completion but isn't there yet uh, is so much of it is in the control of the participants so we are spending an awful lot of time we have about half our participants but we've spent an awful lot of time um, really carefully recruiting which I think is really essential because actually to some extent you know we've devised this and we've built a framework for the project but fundamentally the project is in the hands of our participants as it should be because it's about their voices it's not about Charleston if it were about Charleston or it was about my voice or the curatorial team there then that would defeat the object um just seeing if there's anything I've missed from here no I think that's all fine and the other thing I would say is that we had a a, a lengthy conversation about how the participants in this sense are managed and we came to the conclusion that we would be doing an oral history project on the basis that it affords people the relevant anonymity to talk about sensitive issues or to talk about works that, you know, the collection is not family friendly. And if our podcast is to accurately describe and reflect the works that are in the collection, then I think a reasonable amount of anonymity needs to be afforded to to the members and the participants in the group. Um, so I think that's just one thing that I maybe hadn't bared in mind when I, I came to this uh, that's exceptionally important in terms of recruiting people on board. Um, and then why are we doing this? I think I've covered a lot of this already actually. Um, but it's you know really it really is a bottom up approach and that was really important to me um, as a kind of newbie to the trust about a year ago or so when I became the curatorial assistant under the Kickstart scheme. Um, I noticed that you know a lot of what happens in galleries, muse museums, and you know largely rightly so, is from an academic perspective and it's a very top down approach. And Charleston doesn't have any other outreach projects as well. And I think that was one of the key motivations in securing this grant was that it's something that Charleston wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. It's a very small team at the museum and there is no specific outreach branch. And we do a lot for the LGBT community or around the LGBT community, but we're not necessarily always opening those doors apart from as a visitor to the museum or as you know a, a paying kind of customer and I thought that those perspectives were missing so I thought it'd be really lovely to kind of energize the site with some of those perspectives and kind of rebalance and reframe things um, and I think one of the joys of doing a project like this as I said before is you just don't know what people are going to say and there's a sense of danger to that and there's a sense of joy to that because I'm sure that that they're not going to come with uh, kind of a loaded Bloomsbury and early 20th century art historical perspective. And we have gone out of our way actually to choose people who won't be coming with that background. It's, you know, a completely fresh experience. And I'm really hoping that it does form some really kind of strong links between the LGBT organisations that we've, we've worked with so far to recruit people, um, but also the participants themselves. And I think that ties in really lovely, in a really lovely way with um, 
with Queer Bloomsbury, which is actually happening this weekend. So if anyone can make it along, we have a series of speakers and performers um, who are taking part in our two day festival, Queer Bloomsbury. And it's kind of an alternative prize is the way that it's, it's, it's built. And it's a really lovely two day event and experience as a festival that does some of this engagement work, but what it doesn't do for all that it does is that it doesn't give a voice to everybody who comes through the door, which is our aim with this, this project. And then I suppose finally, you know, um, we're creating what we hope will be a permanent resource, not only a, a kind of semi-historical document, um, but a permanent resource for the trust to use as, you know, future engagement material, but also marketing material. And the timing of this has been obviously to coincide with the current exhibition season in terms of increasing footfall. But then also what it will do is it will allow us to have kind of lots of marketing material and lots of really interesting and genuinely engaging stories to push out in that post Christmas lull that I'm sure many of you in galleries and museums are aware of. Um, and I do have a short, a short paragraph to read from Samson Dietrich who is, as I said before, our PhD researcher, who is specifically looking into the drawings of Duncan Grant. Um, and he unfortunately couldn't be here with us today um, for the reason that he is speaking at Queer Bloomsbury. So I'm very much looking forward to that tomorrow. Um, but Samson, Samson wrote the following for me. Duncan Grant's drawings are a fruitful point of engagement for contemporary audiences in illuminating intersectional issues of sexuality, race and gender. Grant's focus on intimate and erotic non-white masculinities poses questions about the role of whiteness and privilege in the creation of queer aesthetics. Conversely, the drawings also attest to the agency and influence of black artist models and lovers on 20th century artists like Grant. Thus, the collection will be key in efforts to decolonize Bloomsbury scholarship. Moreover, ship, moreover, the proliferation of sexual acts and desires in Grant's drawings present a historical testament to the queer British life, allowing modern audiences to place themselves within a lineage of non-normative sexual and gendered embodiment, challenging historical gay assumptions about gay shame within the context of legal and homophobic repression, the erotic drawings instead communicate queer joy, resistance and perseverance. The collection thus offers a historical queer aesthetic with which to explore contemporary issues such as non-monogamy, alternative relationships and familiar practices and racism with the LG within the LGBT community, trans subjectivities and queer placemaking. Um, I'll move on to my next slide. So, I spoke a little bit about recruitment before, but I think it might be of interest to anyone who is interested in recruiting for similar projects to note that a large part of our budget, in fact, more than half, um, is, has been set aside to compensate participants for their travel expenses. And then in addition to that, some of their time. Um, these expenses are not officially capped and we are keen to minimize any barriers to participation as far as we possibly can. Um, we have agreed kind of uh, recruitment support from various LGBT organisations in Brighton so far. So we're kind of really making a concerted effort here to reach out to the right people because they form the core of what we're doing and the core of the project, um, which has been a little bit hard in some cases because I've had phone calls with a few people who would be really informative and really lovely to kind of engage with and have on the programme. But they... Um, they didn't necessarily fit our criteria in terms of the in terms of the diversity and the um, the kind of approach we're taking with, as I say, a bottom up approach that doesn't come from an art historical assumed prior knowledge place. And I think keeping focus of what the project is about has been crucial all the way through and preserving that integrity of the original vision. Um, I think that's covered and I suppose it's just a few notes in terms of project development. It's not necessarily been a smooth process the entire way through. Um, the project that we started with is in effect the same project that we've ended up with now. Um, and actually, I don't know if I wrote that here, but anyway, I'd like to thank Helen very much uh, for being our officer for this because 
having those really fruitful conversations was exceptionally important to steering the way ahead. It's been fantastic for my development as a Kickstarter um, and kind of guiding the project in a way that says, you know, what can we do that meets the objectives of the museum as a whole and will further kind of the development of Charleston as an organisation uh, whilst matching the needs of the LGBT community. And sometimes those things may have been in small opposition uh, kind of way, finding ways through with that, finding ways around various challenges and always keeping in sight the integrity of the project we set out to do and what those aims and objectives were. I think that's been exceptionally important all of the way through. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's everything so far that I have to say about the project, apart from that I hope that everybody here is, I've piqued your interest and you may tune in on Spotify or indeed come to Charleston to experience very private and also experience very private the conversations at the same time. Thank you. So I'm speaking from the Old Police Sales Museum in Brighton, which was newly accredited in March this year. Um, I am a placement student at Brighton University doing an A in curation and cultural heritage and um, I'm doing a placement of 150 hours so I've been working on this grant since February this year and we're just at the stage where we've installed the exhibition but we haven't had the official opening which is going to be this weekend so I'm um, looking forward to that. The museum is in the basement of the listed town hall in Brighton it's run by volunteers apart from one paid curator and working for two days per week. Um, it's democratised in the sense that all the volunteers get to choose which team they'd like to work on and um, everyone's ideas are considered. There's a, um, a conservation team, an education team, a sort of online team um, and a kind of editorial team at the moment but that's changed uh, around if they've had different teams in the past. Um, we are aiming to be an activist museum and our pre previous curator, E.J. Scott, was um, a big activist curator and did lots of projects around queer histories and uh, the Museum of Transology and they spoke at this launch last year about um, projects they've been involved in. Um, they unfortunately left in at the end of June, um, so we've since had a job share um, curator as an interim measure. The students are split roughly with um, retired police who act as guides around the museum and with people who have specific skills, such as editing, photography and um, conservation skills. Uh, we've just done our annual survey for the first time, so we had roughly 980 visitors and of those 385 were school children. The museum is only open on Saturdays and Mondays. Saturdays is for the public on guided tours and Mondays is for school groups. The creative grant application that we put in was around themes of civil obedience and the whole way through we've debated whether we mean civil obedience or disobedience, but it's officially called civil obedience. Um, it's to do with things of disrupting the museum, which is very much told from the police perspective. Most of the trustees are police or retired police, and we wanted to tell stories of different communities such as LGBTQI and environmental activists. We were awarded the full amount of the grant, and there's just a little extra to the original application there of what we were aiming to do. The, um, so the original project was to set up an advisory board, including environmental activists, members of the LGBTQI plus community. Um, we had two posters of Falcon fracking protests from a police perspective in the collection, which we were planning to display. Um, the, the, an idea which came after the original application was to interview a recently retired chief superintendent who was um, a commander at the Balkan fracking protests. 
which we did. Um, we contacted Caroline Lucas, who was the first Green MP elected to Westminster and the first female MP for Brighton, because she took part in the protests and was arrested at them. And then we wanted to source images of the activists to show more of their perspective, um, not just the police one, and seek interpretation and insight from them as to the experience of being at the protest. And we received the full amount of the grant. Uh, other project strands which the team um, took part in were to research an LGBTQIA plus rainbow lanyard designed by Sussex Police, which you can see on a plinth displayed there, um, and also produce a pride timeline showing national and local Brighton Pride events. I don't know if you can see very well this photo on the right, but it's the old police cells have graffiti examples from when the mods and rockers uh, had a clash on Brighton Seafront in 1964, the Battle of Brighton. So there, there are a couple of cells that have dates from 1964 and things scratched into the walls. The police guides always say they obviously won't search very well if they manage to <laughs> scratch the walls. Um, and as you can see they're from the walls, they've been painted but they, it's um, a grade two listed building. The cement was made using seawater, so the salt leaches out of that and we have various issues with crumbling walls and ceilings in the museum which we've had to work on. So this is me interviewing slash getting an oral history from the retired chief superintendent. Um, which was one hour, and DJ Scott, you can see there, facilitating the interview. Um, I produced the consent form and recording form using British Library forms as a basis. The main purpose of the interview was to ask about Balkan fracking. It was semi-structured, um, but we also asked about pride policing and experience of human resources. And Jane also gave quite a lot of information about how the uniform at protest sets the tone that they're trying to achieve and the tactics they used. She also mentioned the new policing bill that's coming in and the way that Balkan fracking protest was used to train um, officers uh, coming up, newly recruited ones going forward as to how protests should be policed. We conducted the interview over Teams because it didn't have the time limit that Zoom has. Um, and audio clips of this interview, short ones, will be in the cells along with pride footage being projected on the walls. Now, it changes apart from the curator changing, um, <laughs> which was not planned. Um, we decided to use existing advisory boards the police already had with LGBT, race, um, Gypsy, Roma, Traveller and Multi-Faith to engage with those communities about the purpose of the museum and the fact they could work with the museum, that the opportunity was available and volunteers have attended those meetings. The exhibition took place in a smaller cell um, because the original cell we wanted to do it in was set up to look how it would have been when the rest of the people were in it and the tour guides were reluctant to lose that um, that original cell set in the scene for the start of the tour. So we had to put it in a slightly smaller cell, which fortunately still had modern rocker graffiti, um, but it meant we couldn't include both of the police images. We could only include one of them and we had to make various other changes like putting our projector in the corridor rather than in the same room as the other items. But we're pleased with how it looks now. I think it, it works well. It was originally meant to be completed in um, June this year, but um, it slipped by a few months to now, but we're wrapping up the ends of the project at the moment. Um, obviously, the police boards that they had in place didn't already include environmental activists, so that was the one group of people that had to be engaged with separately. Um, to do this, I was quite wary of speaking to them, and I approached an academic at Brighton University who researches fracking and um, extraction of fossil fuels, and they shared my concerns and said that a lot of the protesters have been traumatised by the tactics the police used at the protest, um, which 
having done some research and seen that um, police have been accused of using social media to identify protesters and the use of language with the police is that these people are non-violent extremists rather than environmental protesters um, they there's sort of um, been a build-up of hostility on both sides I would say around since the Balkan protests which was one of the first ones um, and three subsequent protests so, so wanting to avoid re-traumatizing people or um, you know causing further harm I decided to approach a group and ask a representative of the group to provide information rather than an individual named protester and the academic um, sent me details of a contact who agreed to be involved. They were um, fairly hostile to the police. They made it clear they did not want to be in a police controlled space from the beginning. And it made me realise the importance of communication because the words that I used were quite museum-y and I mentioned things like adding voices to the museum which made the person think that I wanted them to physically be in the museum talking to people, which they would not have been comfortable with at all. Um, so it made me realise that I needed to be very clear about what I wanted. And it was difficult to balance the relationship and not be coercive because they were asking me to choose photographs, which were um, on a Facebook site and which the photographer was happy for us to use free of charge. Um, but at the same time, I wanted them to say what they wanted to say and not just say what we wanted them to say. So it was quite a tricky balance to get. Um, this photograph here, unfortunately, we couldn't use in the exhibition because there were about 2000 photos and I looked through all of them to choose. Unfortunately, when this one was enlarged, the quality wasn't good enough to use in the exhibition. So we then had to plan around what would actually um, print up well. The expectations of the protesters, um, um, it's still an ongoing conversation. They, The last time I communicated with them, they said they didn't really understand the purpose of the exhibition and they haven't minced their words in the statement they wrote for us. Um, they seemed confused as to why I'd chosen images of sort of smiling, colourful, happy protesters with placards when there were also images of police with their hands on arresting people um, and using various tactics which have been discussed in Parliament um, subsequently. So it's tricky to explain that we need to get a balance between lots of children coming to the museum and not wanting to put them off protesting, but at the same time, um, letting the activists say what they really think. <laughs> and we've put their statement in pretty much as they said it, just a few changes to tenses and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see how it's received by the, the trustees and the tour guides, um, some of whom are not as liberal and um, pro-activist as the students and other volunteers. Um, also, we wanted to ideally collect some of the protest materials that have been used, but this is difficult because a lot of them have been confiscated by the police. There was another protester we were put in touch with who offered to loan us objects, um, a photograph and a t-shirt they wore at the protest but as the t-shirts were produced in a limited run and were given out free of charge to protesters they didn't want to risk not getting the item back again at the end so unfortunately we had to turn down the offer to loan in those objects and, and just ask for donations there's the possibility we might still be given some other objects from protesters and um, that's still an ongoing discussion that we're having um, hopefully we can, but we'll have the interview accessioned into the collection um, and these images which have been framed for the exhibition. And we have some um, examples of leaflets that um, explain backing and why people object to it. Um, installing the exhibition in a building has been challenging and we've had to use Velcro strips which um, 
our fear for whoever has to take them down after us but that would seem to be the as a way that would avoid damaging the walls and all the lines of the building on the monkey skew it but um, we've done our best with it the disparate themes i think our grant shows an example of how you can choose lots of small projects it did make quite a challenge for the student writing and introductory board as to what the exhibition was about to try and link all these themes but i think they've managed quite well um, due to using the smaller cell rather than the larger one we decided to put additional objects photographed in the online exhibition and things that we ran out of space for and the education team have asked for evaluation around um, various prompts such as what would take you onto the streets to protest, how have you <coughs> felt in police um, in protest and um, yeah as I said the audio will be um, will be there as well. The, I think EJ spoke in the last year's grant launch about why the things are used as catalog rather than modes, which they used to use. It's a lower cost um, site. You can have multiple off-site users accessing it at the same time, and it's quite intuitive. So with a museum that's like larger volunteers, there's less time um, you have to train people for. And it's got an app you can have on your phone, and I've used it to accession objects while I'm not at the museum. If you've taken the photos of the objects on the phone, then that cuts out the stage of, um, of processing so they have to get them onto the computer. This is the image we didn't have space to show, unfortunately. And as you can see, the protesters are very much in the background and can't really make out much of what's going on. And they've got the police medics right in the foreground here. Um, these are some of the participant experiences from the student researcher and an education volunteer. Um, we had some quite nice responses to the wise timeline. Um, the same people that had been involved with it saying that when you see the actual um, label, it just means so much more than, than when you're taking part in it. Um, and yeah, people have had mixed responses. The person researching the lanyard felt that that a, person, a police officer wearing a lanyard would necessarily make them more approachable or um, make them feel more comfortable talking to them, which was the aim of the lanyard. But um, yeah, it's been an interesting balance to try and achieve. So here's further information. I believe the online exhibition still says coming soon rather than being there, but it is being in the process of being put up. And this is a protest helmet and gauntlets, which the police officer has offered to donate to us for our collection, which is quite good because a lot of the school children see the old fashioned um, uniform and can try it on and things, but it's good to have some more modern examples for when they come out. Um, oh, I was just going to say, Liz Truss, in one of her first actions as Prime Minister, has overturned our backing as well, so it's definitely not an issue that's going on. I missed that, Rosie. What's Liz Truss done? He's overturned the moratorium on fracking, so it's right. um, so it might be, you know, well, it probably is going to get uh, raised again as an issue. Um, I started as the curator at Amberley in late April this year. Um, so my predecessor um, submitted the application um, for this grant. Um, so we didn't really start doing work on it until May, just as a bit of a background. Um, Um, but I'll give a background about Amberley Museum. So it's a working museum situated in former chalk pits in the South Downs National Park. And the museum showcases the industrial and technological history of Southeast England and has over a 36 acre site. It's kind of got lots of different collection areas and display areas. Um, we have over 300 active volunteers um, who help at the museum, and many of these volunteers are uh, people who've worked in the industries that the museum now showcases. So they bring a lot of technical expertise 
and subject specialist knowledge um, that helps us understand objects and demonstrate objects in the collection. Um, we applied for the grants because a lot of our current display interpretation focuses on kind of the technical development of these industries, um, but doesn't really touch upon people's personal experiences. So either whether um, whether it's the people that developed um, the innovations in those industries um, or how it's impacted on people's daily lives. So, um, yeah, my predecessor and I both kind of want to kind of change the interpretation and the focus of the interpretation. Um, so where people are currently mentioned in the interpretation, it's often in the role of inventor, um, which in the majority of cases is usually white and male. So it's we're worried that it's kind of presenting a view or to visitors that only white males have kind of made significant contributions to these fields. And we, yeah, we wanted to kind of showcase kind of other voices, people from um, eth different ethnic backgrounds and women and kind of dig deeper and find those kinds of stories. So the aim was to make new connections with two groups uh, who both kind of support previously underrepresented people in the fields of engineering. So it's the Women's Engineering Society and the Association for Black and Ethnic Minority Engineers. Um, so we wanted to collaborate with them to kind of reveal hidden people stories within both our electrical and communication collections. Um, so this is a bit of a, these two organizations seem like a perfect fit because they both kind of want to promote and encourage other people to kind of follow these careers um so that's a little bit about the two groups oh what have i done okay um so the, the, we were yeah we my predecessor selected three kind of collection areas or display areas that we that would could benefit from this kind of collaboration so we've got uh, Connected Earth Exhibition Hall, which kind of showcases the development of um, telecommunications, including telegrams, the telephone and the internet. And then we also, there's uh, Electricity Hall, which kind of showcases the development of uh, equipment for generating and supplying electricity. And then it also kind of shows the impact of impact on, uh, of electricity on daily life. So kind of domestic appliances and how they've transform people's lives. And then finally, the third area was the radio and television exhibition, which um, also inc includes equipment from both domestic and military settings. And we kind of, there were, in the radio and TV, there's uh, a sm there's bits or there's some objects and a bit of interpretation relating to the first female amateur radio enthusiast and kind of how the development developments she had made have kind of benefited the industry um, but there wasn't a lot so we kind of wanted to dig deeper um, so our approach to the project was for it to be between the curatorial staff the two external groups that we were going to approach and our volunteers who have subject specialist knowledge of the collection um, so we didn't want it to be just the two, the, 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 the curatorial side is myself, the curator, and we've got a curatorial assistant who came on board in summer 2021 as a Kickstarter placement as well. Um, so we didn't want it, us to be doing like all the work and selecting the people and then kind of presenting these people's stories. We wanted to engage these two organizations that, um, have also kind of done quite a lot of heritage work. So um, the Women's Engineering Society celebrated their centenary in 2019, and they did a, a lot of work um, uncovering um, female engineers and the kind of contribution they've played 
and it was a project that was funded and then they set up wikipedia pages for the key people that they'd uncovered so we we're going to draw upon some of that work um yes yeah, so we wanted to work together so the aim was to research and select about 12 to 15 often unacknowledged individuals from minority groups in the history and development of electrical and telecommunication technologies to include in our displays and then we we're going to work with this co-created content um, to be developed with the designer and then install it in the in the galleries um, so the aim aims of the, our collaboration are to um, have previous yeah currently underrepresented groups included in our displays increasing cultural and gender diversity and making our displays more inclusive to all our visitors and hopefully to encourage more women and people from eth um, uh, ethnic minority backgrounds to explore a career in catering uh, um, engineering so yeah present role models um progress so far so pro you might notice that kind of the way i'm talking about it a we've kind of a lot of the planning has happened but the core part of the project yet hasn't yet happened so the application was accepted i think late december last year and um as i said we're a small museum so there's two members of the curatorial team so for the first four months of this year there wasn't a curator uh in post so that kind of caused quite that meant the whole unfortunately the project and the work towards it didn't progress at the time scale that was originally put on our application. Um, we confirmed the involvement of the Women's Engineering Society in May this year, which was really good, and we had a really positive response from them um, and discussed kind of how we're going to approach the research. However, the Association for Black and ethnic minority engineers, we only managed to confirm their involvement in September. Um, so in the meantime, we have been drawing up using the Women's Engineering Society website and other kind of sources, we've been drawing up a very long list of potential historical people to include in the displays. And then we're planning to work now that we've got both organisations on board, we're going to work with the two groups to select a short list and research the content together in more detail. Um, uh, so that kind of leads on to the lessons learned um, because part of the delays have been caused by not having uh, a curator in post who is the key person that was meant to be leading the project. Um, also the two groups that we were keen to work with, we had, uh, hadn't been approached before the application was accepted. Um, so, yeah, my advice would be to anybody that you plan to work with, make sure they're on board while you're doing your application before it's accepted. Because um, a lot of valuable project time has been spent uh, trying to secure their involvement. Um, and in the worst case scenario, if one or both of them hadn't want wanted to be involved or weren't able to be involved we'd have been in a position of using more time up trying to find alternative organizations to work with um the other kind of lesson is create a project team of key museum staff and volunteers who will work on the project and so it's not just one person leading it um so we have lots of different people on board with the different people in, on the museum side on board, whether it's the subject specialist volunteers and curatorial staff, rather than it being one member of staff, because a lot of the delay has been caused. But we're finally in a position where we can kind of go full pelt into the core bit of the project now, which, yeah, we're really looking forward to actually doing it. But that would be my advice as the person kind of with the shortest presentation for obvious reasons uh of yeah for people thinking of applying for next year yeah think of that stuff in advance i think 